It says we're live. Hello, hello. It's four o'clock Pacific, six o'clock Central here in Costa Rica, Central, seven o'clock on the East Coast, midnight in Dublin, 1 a.m. Wednesday morning in London and most of Europe, 8.30 and 9.30 a.m. Wednesday morning in Australia, 11.30, I think, a.m. in New Zealand, and it's Facebook Live. Hello, everyone. Hello. And uh, uh, it's really great to be with you. I hope you've had a nice holiday. Uh, this is going to be, our guest is not here yet. I don't know why. There's always some technical difficulty somewhere. So in the meantime, I'm just going to do questions. I'm going to answer questions. And while I'm looking on my phone to bring up and say hello to people who give a shout out, uh, uh, but the first question that always comes when we're talking about this topic of wheat related disorders and the brain is why do I feel cravings? And it's because there are a lot of different components in wheat, not just gluten. That's the one that's gotten the bad boy reputation, but there's a lot of components in wheat. One of them is called gluteal morphins. And the gluteal morphins have that name. They're a component of wheat. It's a piece of the protein that's not digested very well, and that's called a peptide. So it's a peptide that actually stimulates the opiate receptors, like opium or like cocaine. Not to the degree, but still a little bit of a feel good. Uh, enough to where people say, oh, I don't need to eat wheat, I just like it. And they think they're fine, you know, because they're, they're not um, feeling the addiction until you stop, try to stop eating wheat. And the people that have the hardest time in giving up wheat are the ones that have elevated antibodies to gluteal morphins. And that's what we find that out in a simple blood test. And if you've got those, those antibodies elevated, then one of the things that we always say is, you know, it's probably going to be better if you transition off of gluten as opposed to going cold turkey. Probably better to transition. And uh, uh, I'm trying to pull up uh, myself here on my phone. Marcy is going, um, there I am, there I am. Oh, oh I look the same, but I'm looking for the comments so I can do the shout outs. Let's see. Uh, let me turn off the volume. I got it now. Oh, Karen DeBrango says she's here. Uh, 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 Karen, hi. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, okay, team, Karen says she's here in the comments, but she's not here with us. Karen's our guest tonight. And uh, uh, my team will figure it out now where, where, how to get care. Where's Karen? Where's Karen? Jill says, I've been eating gluten-free for six months, thanks to you. I'm afraid to go out to eat. How often can I use wheat rescue? And will there be any side effects? Jill, you can use it with every meal. And there are no side effects. Uh, I've, never, I've not noticed any side effects at all to using wheat rescue or E3 Advanced Plus. They both are gluten digesting enzymes, second to none. There's nothing on the market that compares to them. The difference between the two is that if you get gut symptoms and when you give up wheat, your gut symptoms are better, then you're probably better off with the E3 Advanced Plus. But for people that don't get gut symptoms like bloating and gas or cramps, uh, uh, diarrhea or constipation, if you don't get gut symptoms, then you're probably better off with wheat rescue, probably. Probably, and but they're both great. Marzi and I take both of them. We'll take one of each uh, often, uh, depending on the meal. You know, if I'm doing a gluten-free pasta, I'm going to do one of each uh, before you start eating. And you always take the enzymes before you begin eating. Now, with all other digestive enzymes, we recommend you take them in the middle of a meal. That's because. The digestive enzymes that you're taking in the middle of a meal, they're in the middle of that glob of food and they'll digest from the inside coming out. So your enzymes can digest from the outside coming in. And it's a great one-two combination. 
But with these, because you don't want any peptides, components of proteins that aren't digested very well, getting into the first part of the intestines, out of the stomach into the first part of the intestines, you take E3 Advanced Plus or Wheat Rescue before you start eating. So nothing gets through. And if I'm doing a meal that's a lot of gluten-free product, but grain like gluten-free pasta, I'll take one before and I'll take one in the middle of the meal. Uh, and you can take it two beforehand if you want, but um, I'm being a little more comprehensive, I think, in supporting my system by taking one before, always before, and then one in the middle. So uh, Mary says, hi, I'm listening from Washington State. Way to go, Mary, thank you for being here. Annie's here from Ontario, four days starting gluten-free. Way to go, Annie, way to go. Just remember to be kind to yourself. Uh, Karen, uh, Karen DeBrango says, hey, Dr. Tom, invite me in. So staff, uh, please uh, connect with Karen and see how to get her in here. Uh, I don't know what to do with that. Kathleen's watching, hi, Kathleen. Marie's here from Toronto. Um, Shanquila, who always has great questions, says, please talk about what lowers TGF beta one and what can lower it mine has gone up from 9,000 to 13,000. Uh, TGF beta, oh, it looks like Karen is almost here. Um, she's on, the box is on my screen, but it's blank. Karen, I'm not sure that your camera's on. There you are. Oh, you're, you're silent, uh, you, you're on mute, you're on mute. Let's try. How about now? Oh, perfect. You're fantastic. You're... Fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> of course, of course. Beautiful dress, very celebratory dress. Thank you so much. Thank you. Trying to stay in the festive spirit. <laughs> yes, yes. It's nice to hang on to that for a while if we can. Absolutely, absolutely. So let me begin by talk by saying a little about Karen. I'm going to read it so that I don't um, uh, blow it. <laughs> Quite honestly, you know, so make sure I, I get everything said that needs to be said here. Um, and uh, Karen, I met Karen when she reached out to me and asked if I would write a little something for her book that was coming out. And uh, I think we had met before then. I think we, we had. Did. We yeah. did, actually, yes, in Clearwater. In, oh, that, that's right. Now I remember. Yes. yes. And, and that beautiful spread, the food that they had after my talk, I now I remember that clear water event. Yes, Natalia Levy. Yes, she's wonderful. It was great. It was really great. And uh, Karen wrote a book and she asked if I would write a few comments about it and I did. And I, well, first I read it and then I thought, my God, this is really important. So what Karen brings to the table on this topic of going gluten free and um, she brings a lot to the table, but the one thing that was unique for me was she talked about it from the perspective of a relationship. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to pause for a minute because it's time to say hello. Here's oh, the little bruiser. Beauty, <laughs> hello. That's Karen. Yeah, Hi, Karen. sweetie. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Oh, I've yeah. been watching the whole story unfold. Beautiful, beautiful family. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, it's his bedtime now, but he's, oh, he's oh. hypnotized by you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, I, I wish there was a way to have everybody on the screen that's out there, you know, and, you know, hundreds, hundreds of little faces and all that, but it's not possible. But he sees you and he says, oh, hi. <laughs> okay. Oh, night, 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 night. So about Karen, about Karen, Karen's a bye bye night, night. I know, I know. Breaks my heart when he cries. Karen's a national board certified health and wellness coach, a certified international health coach, a certified functional nutrition counselor, and one of our certified gluten-free practitioners. Yes. 
Uh, she provides individual and group health coaching services, as well as workshops, seminars, public speaking, and written content. And uh, it goes on for quite a, quite a bit more. Uh, her, her, her book, I'll just say it that way, her book is called 30 Days to Gluten Freedom. And what I really liked about her book, there's a lot of good information, but I, what I really liked about it was that she talks about gluten as a relationship and kind of a, a pathological relationship. Mm -hmm. Right, and that you know yeah. you kind of get addicted to being abused in a sense. One way. <laughs> so, Karen, can, can can you talk a little about that? How how did you come to look at it that way and express that? Sure, absolutely. Great question. So, yes, the book is Thirty Days to Gluten Freedom: Break Up with Gluten and Really Mean It. And I know there's probably countless people out there watching that have made every attempt to stop eating gluten, but then this happens or a holiday or well, just a little bit isn't going to bother me. And what I discovered in my coaching practice is people are coming to me. I get a lot of referrals from GI docs that are saying, here's patients with celiac disease. I send them on their way, tell them don't eat gluten, come back in six months. And guess what? They're still eating gluten. They're not fully understanding what it's doing in their body. So I kind of approach this from two fronts. One is everything that you've given to me as a CGP, Dr. Tom, all of the science and the background behind what's happening in our bodies, what's happening even to our mind when we're consuming gluten so that the, the clients have a full understanding of what's going on in there, right? Because until they can really internalize what's happening physically and even mentally, it's a little bit difficult to just make that connection I just have to stop eating this, even though I've been eating it for 40 or 50 or 60 years, right? And then the other piece of it was it's cultural. It's part of who we are, especially just coming off of a holiday, uh, two holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas for a lot of us. Um, a lot of the foods, you know, people go home for Christmas, right? They look forward to grandma's food. They look forward to mom's favorite recipes. And if you are diagnosed with something and can no longer consume that, it kind of rocks your world. And the book actually was born out of a relationship between one of my clients and myself. And her name, we call her Marley for all HIPAA purposes, right? She's, she's a incognito, so to speak. And Marley came to me very similar. I have a gluten-related disorder. I can't have gluten. I'm struggling. I'm a, I'm a mom. I have two small children. I don't like to let food go to waste. And this might sound familiar to a lot of moms. There's food on the plate and they just kind of munch, munch, munch as we're cleaning up and eating what the children are leaving behind. Also struggling with being busy, school activities, all of the above, right? So Marley came to me and she said, I have to go gluten-free, but I'm struggling. So we set up a plan. We got through about 21 days, long enough, right? To make a habit, 21 days. And then the holidays happened and somebody came by with a platter of cookies and she felt really guilty by not taking some of those cookies. So she thought, well, just a little bit, it's not gonna hurt me. I'll take some over the counter, I'll be okay. And the more she had, the more she craved. And she wasn't having the immediate, I have to run to the bathroom, right? And the over the counters were suppressing the symptoms. But the more she ate, the more she craved, and the more she craved, the higher her anxiety went, and the more out of control her moods went. And we got to a point where she literally was in a very dark, dark place. And I said to her, Dr. Tom, I cannot in good conscience continue to serve you in this manner. I need to refer you out to a mental health counselor. Well, at that moment, she about had a nervous breakdown and said, please, I only wanna to talk to you, what else can I do? I said, we need to at least loop your husband into this process so that somebody else is accountable. It cannot just all be on me. I'm worried for your well being. So she agreed to that. I said, this is on a temporary basis. We have to see how this goes. And so we all agreed. And her husband said, please, whatever you do, bring me back the 21 days of Marley. And I said, 21 days of Marley, what is this? And he says to me, this is when. She managed to go the full 21 days without gluten. 
her anxiety disappeared, her mood swings went away, she was happy. I recognized her as the woman I fell in love with. She was being kind and generous and gracious in our household, and it was fun to be around her. Bring that woman back. So I started to think about this from the relationship standpoint, right? She's got this addictive kind of passive aggressive relationship with gluten. And the more she has, the more she wants, the more she craves, and it's an endless cycle. So I put into writing these journals and they're all throughout the book. There's 30 days worth of them. And you're really addressing gluten from the standpoint of an ex, right? And so if you wanna look at it as your, your girlfriend's best guide to a breakup, um, I'm kind of like your guide on the side. And I'm helping her and others to understand what gluten is doing mentally, physically, emotionally, and how to shift our mindset to make shift happen so that we can move beyond what our expectation is in the kitchen, at a dining room table, going out to eat, wherever it is that we might be, we have shifted the mindset completely so that we are not allowing that X to come back in. And that's so, sort of so where I'm this came from. I'm gonna pause you right there. Sure. And so by, by having people journal yes. on a daily basis, what you're asking them to do is to be conscious of where they are right now and what yes. they're feeling. And that, that has so much benefit for so many reasons that it's okay to have um, uh, uh, vulnerable moments where you yeah. just, you know, I'm really craving something right now. And it's okay. But, and if you acknowledge it, am I correct that your clients have given you feedback that says things they said, you said in the book, and that mm -hmm. is, it doesn't have the same power over me if I'm writing it down. Exactly. Exactly right. And when they have the opportunity to go back and read it, because this is like a homework assignment for them, right? It's part of their goals, part of their session work. And we come back together and I they're sending me, right? They're sending me screenshot of here's what I did. This is what I wrote. And then our next session, our next meeting face to face, I'm asking them, read your words aloud to me. So now not only have they written them, they've processed the emotion, they've written it down. Now they're hearing themselves say it back. And it's kind of like a light bulb because they're saying, oh my gosh, I said that. I really said that. So I must have really meant it. And then we can dive deeper into how do we unravel this? How do we work backwards? And how do we get out of that hole? Right. right. That's, that's such a powerful tool to use. I'm really... Uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, grateful that, uh, well, I was grateful when I read your book and that's why I wrote the forward that I did. But um, as you're talking about, because that's something that we haven't talked about that much is about journaling and yes. the, criti the critical benefit of journaling. And especially for you know those that don't like talk about their feelings and talk about okay. what's going on. Um, that's extremely powerful because you write something down no one's going to read it but you, mm -hmm. and so you're safe with getting it out of your head and out on paper so it doesn't have that same dominance over you. I think that's really Absolutely. great. Absolutely. And we take it, I take it a step further too, because we're not just journaling our thoughts and our emotions and where we are, like you said, in the moment, but we're also journaling the food intake. So we're going, I call it from plate to bowl or bowl to bowl, right? The bowl in front of you has a direct relationship with what happens in the bowl behind you in the bathroom behind closed doors. So we're journaling about our food, our mood, our mental and emotional mood, but our body's mood, what aches, what pains, what headaches, what anxiety, what's creeping up for you. And also our poop. What does that look like? How often are you going? And it's remarkable, Dr. Tom, how many people come to me and say, I was only going three times a week. I finished sessions with you. I go three times a day. I didn't know it was possible. Yeah, yeah, that's so very common. For those of you out there who never thought about it, normal bowel movements are supposed to occur after every meal. Mm -hmm. You have to make room for what's coming down the tube. And yes. And so many people think it's normal to have a bowel movement every three days or every two days. 
It is not. It is not. That's a sign that there's some problem, some dysfunction there. And so this is a way, as Karen is saying, this is another tool that can help. I'm going to do a couple shout outs here and, yes. and then we're going to go to the questions about your area of expertise, Karen. So first is Shanquila's question about uh, TGF beta one. So uh, Shanquila, um, yours has gone up from 9,000 to 13,000. Um, you know, you, you can't say for sure, but it goes up after a uh, fracture. So when your bone's healing, um, it goes up, but it also can go up with some cancers. So you just wanna be checked because that's not normal to have it go up like that. There are papers that talk about it comes down when a tumor of tumors removed in breast cancer, and then TGF one beta TGF beta one comes down after the tumor is removed. Uh, other papers talk about there's a subset of colon cancers where it can go up. Um, so you you just want to have a good exam by a thorough practitioner at this point. And it's not my area of expertise. I don't know of a uh, normal reason why TGF beta one goes up. Um, I don't know what the reference range is. I'm assuming 9,000 that you talked about is the uh, within the normal reference range and then it's going up from there. So there's a sign here, good for you for catching it. Now do some footwork to figure out um, why it's gone up. Uh, Marie's here from Toronto. Kathleen Cousins is watching. Jill um, says, I've been eating gluten-free for, so oh, thanks to you. Um, uh, Oh, I, I read that one already. And there was Karen and Annie's in Ontario. Mary says, I'm listening from Washington State. Priscilla says, I had a terrible time going gluten-free after a celiac diagnosis. I was so convinced that eating whole wheat, rye and pumpernickel um, was the only way to live. I also lived where I could get home cooked Italian food. Who would ever want to give up that wonderful affordable food? Well, if you were diagnosed with celiac, you would want to give up that wonderful, I grew up Italian. My grandparents came from Italy. They came through Ellis Island and you know the history of America and all that. And I grew up with homemade pasta, not, not every day, but all the time. And raviolis and mostacellis and canada leaves. I mean, it, it, it's what I grew up on. And I love that food and it took me um, a while, you know, it's a joke that it took me eight years to give up my mother's Christmas cookies after I declared I'm going gluten free. It took me eight years. Karen, have you had that kind of experience with with your clients where sometimes there's the comfort food or something yes. like? Yes, absolutely. And actually, in the pandemic, I'm seeing a lot of people saying, I knew better, but I was sick and I couldn't go out and it was just easy and it was just there and I didn't think it was gonna have that big of an effect on me. And next thing you know, I'm more sick than I started because I had gluten. So yes, people people give in for a number of reasons. Yeah. And part of what this program that's designed around the book, the 30 Days to Gluten Free, uh, Gluten Freedom Group Program is to help people have a safe space where they can realize that just because you gave in to that temptation does not make you a failure, it makes you human. And so we have to learn how to undo that which we have been doing in some cases, some people for decades upon decades. And it's a difficult task and it's hard it, it was really encouraging. I have a, a local doctor, uh, Dr. Narula, he's a gastroenterologist, and he recognized right off that there are a lot of people struggling with, you have this diagnosis, right? You have celiac or Crohn's or what have you, and you need to go gluten-free. And then he was frustrated, but why aren't they doing it? They know better, but they do they? Do they really know better? Do they understand the full science behind it? Right. Well, that's why you need someone to guide you into how to stock your um, shelves in your pantry and your refrigerator. Yeah. Exactly. Right Cynthia's here from Ottawa. Barb's here from Washington Township. She says, welcome, Dr. DeBrango. Lisa's here. Thank you for your time. Um, you're an angel. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, Marty says, need this book. Many attempts. Good for you, Marty, for acknowledging, hey, man, I, I need some support here. I've tried many times. Good for you. 
And uh, Karen's approach, it works. It's, it's a great concept. Uh, Lori says 200 stars. Well, thank you, Lori. I don't know if you guys, I've not said anything in a while, but I love seeing the stars, you know, and the hearts. And it's really empowering. Uh, uh, makes me want to do more when I see all of those. Uh, Jill says, my gastroenterologist swears I don't need to be gluten-free based on the biopsies he's done. I told him about your work. Can your staff post some of the Alessio Fasano studies so I can show my doctor? He thinks I'm eating gluten-free unnecessarily and that it can actually be harmful to the microbiome by excluding certain nutrients. I have Hashimoto's and don't want to get another autoimmune disease. Um, that's um, a very common scenario that people come up against is that their gastroenterologist just doesn't know, just okay. doesn't know what the science says. And uh, yeah, and let's post a couple of the studies here in the chat, uh, the links to uh, PubMed for Dr. Fasanos and some of the other studies that I've talked about that we've posted uh, so that she can um, take a look at those. Amal says, hi from California, happy 2022. You're the first to say that, Amal, thank you so much. Dale says, how's your practice compared to Dorinda Smith's? I don't know who Dorinda Smith is. Do you know who Dorinda Smith is? No. Okay, I'm sorry, sure Dale, can't, can't help you with that one. Uh, oh, Shanquila asked, forgot to ask, can mold raise TGF beta one? Yes, yes, it can. Uh, Sally says, started baking everything gluten-free. It's easy and it tastes great with good recipes. Cat the Loopy Whisk has great recipes. Uh, okay, Cat the Loopy Whisk has great recipes. You know, I'm really proud of the recipes in my two books. Um, the second one, You Can Fix Your Brain, I asked, uh, I think it was 13 or 14 of my friends, send me your favorite easy, gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free breakfast, lunch, and dinner recipe. Send me three recipes, one breakfast, one lunch, one dinner. So you've got JJ Virgin with her favorite <laughs> recipe. You've got Alan Christensen. You've got David Perlmutter with their favorite recipes. And um, they're, they're not Julia Child recipes. You know, they're, they, they don't require a degree in uh, um, chef cooking in order to do that. And are, are there recipes in your book? So there are no recipes in my book, but in the group program, we do talk about recipes and converting recipes using tried and true certified gluten-free products when we're replacing flours and other things to make that consistency that we're so used to. But I do have two chefs that are spotlighted in the book and in the group program in our final week, they're both doing demos for us, cooking demos. So the first is chef, I don't know if you can see her here, yes. chef Maria. Maria Abraham is the fit foodie. She is the founder of Eat Cleaner and Eat Like You Give a Fork is her book. And she is fantastic. She's very witty, very sly and a lot of fun. And she's gonna talk to us about gluten-free grains and help us put together some uh, Valentine's Day meal and dessert. And then our other chef is chef, let's see if I get her lined up here, chef Cece Chia Pian. And she is a celebrity chef to the likes of people like, I think I can say this, she's already mentioned it, uh, Will Smith, among many others. And she has her own spice line, Aft Cafe Spices. And so we have a spice it up cooking segment in our group program. And she's going to help people understand that gluten-free food does not have to be bland or boring or expensive. So I'm looking forward to both of those ladies sharing their chef expertise, along with my cooking hacks, I call it. So <laughs> marvelous, marvelous. Lisa has a comment. I've also met folks from upstate New York who claim to have the original wheat grain that even a celiac can eat. Their bread goes for about $10 a loaf. Lisa, there's never been a paper that I've read that um, uh, a celiac can eat um, different strains of wheat bread, except there was one paper, one paper that came out in 2014, and they've not published anything about that since then. But they developed a sourdough that used seven different cultures of lactobacillus San Franciscus. 
And when they used these seven cultures, the proteins of wheat were so broken down that celiacs could eat it and there was no evidence of any increased inflammation or increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, which is the technical geek stuff that means you're inflamed and mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're gonna wear down your microvilli. It's the only thing I've ever seen, but it's not commercially viable. It took two or three days, uh, if I'm remembering the paper correctly, to for the, the dough to ferment enough to where it broke down all the protein. So Lisa, whatever they're telling you, there's, I'm unfamiliar with any science for it. It may be true, but I'm unfamiliar with anything. But here's how you know. You do the wheat zoomer test right now. And if you have any antibodies elevated to the peptides of wheat, then you know that you're not squeaky clean right now. There's already something going on. But if you've been strictly gluten-free and you do the wheat zoomer and it comes back negative, and the test to make sure it's an accurate test, you have to include looking at total immunoglobulins, meaning is your immune system worn out so you really can't look to markers of the immune system because your bank account's already dry, right? So as long as you have adequate amounts of total immunoglobulins, the test is very accurate. So if it comes back negative, meaning you're doing really well, then go eat that bread. Go eat that bread, try it for a couple of weeks, and then do the test again and see if your immune system gets reactivated trying to protect you. That's the only way because symptoms don't matter. Mm -hmm. Because you can eat something and you don't feel bad after you eat it does not mean it's okay. Because if you make the antibodies to wheat, if you increase the antibodies to wheat, the real danger for people, and many of you have heard me say this, the ratio is eight to one. For every one person that gets gut symptoms, there are eight that don't. And so they don't feel bad when they eat wheat, but they get brain symptoms, which can be depression or seizures or anxiety or schizophrenia. Or they get joint symptoms where they feel like they're getting old and their joints, they just hurt. Or they get skin symptoms or they get thyroid symptoms and they get Hashimoto's. So it, if because you don't feel bad when you eat it doesn't mean it's okay. The only way to determine if it's okay is to do the wheat zoomer. So you have to have a negative wheat zoomer first. So if you, you do it, and if it's not negative, you, you got to be cleaner than what you currently are. I mean, you have to explore why am I still positive? And once you get it down to negative, a negative wheat zoomer, then go eat that bread for a couple of weeks and then do the test again. Karen, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think that is perfect. And I say that all the time and I get asked that question all the time as well, but I don't feel any symptoms and I think I'm okay. And just a little bit won't hurt me or I can take a modium, right? Or something over the counter that's gonna squelch that symptom. And I have to keep reinforcing the fire is still burning below. There's right. still inflammation at large. And the more you bring gluten on board, the more that fire is going to burn and eventually consume what is your immune system. And like you always say, the autoimmune diseases, they, they come in pairs, they come in groups and they're gonna start rolling in. And it's, it's exhausting, but I say it all the time. And I just, I love hearing you say it. And I want for you to say it again, please, to everyone that's listening, please hear him when he speaks, say it one more time. Well, um... When you have an exposure to wheat, if you have a wheat sensitivity, the antibodies that get elevated are elevated for a minimum of two to four months from yes. one exposure, meaning more inflammation, more inflammation, more yes. inflammation for two to four months. And if the weak link in your chain is your thyroid, that inflammation is attacking your thyroid, attacking your thyroid, attacking your thyroid from one exposure. So it doesn't matter how you feel when you eat it. Um, Cindy had a question. What about Himalayan tartary buckwheat? The very best product on the market. The very most comp And I have done a very poor job this year. And I want to do a much better job in 2022 
on Himalayan tartary buckwheat. It is a, and actually we're gonna do an episode. I'm gonna have a special guest in the new year on Himalayan tartary buckwheat. It is the only product, it's the most potent antioxidant of any food out there. Yeah, I'll wait to talk about it more, but absolutely excellent, excellent product for you. Excellent product for you. Patty says, wait a minute, Patty, is there two parts to this? Uh, um, Allison says, autoimmune come in pairs. What do you mean? No one gets one autoimmune disease. Uh, you get one that's primary, that causes symptoms first, and so that's what you get diagnosed with. But if you were to do a screen, the test is Cyrex Labs array number five, the autoimmunity, autoimmune panel. It looks at 24 different antibodies to your own body. Six to your brain, four to your heart, four to your gut, two to your thyroid, your liver, your reproductive system. If you do that screen, you see where your immune system is attacking your own tissue right now, where there are autoimmune mechanisms killing off tissue, killing off tissue, killing off tissue right now. Remember, it takes anywhere from three to 15, oh, is it 15? Systemic sclerosis, 11 years, three to 11 years of elevated antibodies before you ever get symptoms because the elevated antibodies are attacking your thyroid. You don't feel that, but when it kills off thyroid cells and when the antibodies are elevated, you're losing more cells than you're making. And so eventually when you've lost so many cells, now that tissue, the thyroid, the adrenals, the liver, your joints, whatever it is, now that tissue can't function adequately now you start getting dysfunction. And what does that look like? Pain or skin problems or depression or anxiety. But that's what the symptom, when the symptoms come, you didn't just get the disease. It's been there for a few years already. So if you do Cyrex array number five, that's the screen that tells you, wow, really? I've got all of these tissues elevated right now. The antibodies elevated to all these different tissues. Yes. Well, what do I do? Reduce the inflammation. Why is your immune system on fire right now? Where is it coming from? Karen, anything you want to add to that one? I talk a lot about reducing inflammation. It's part of my approach because we have to look at everything holistically. We can't just zero in and say gluten is the only factor, right? We know this. So there are so many other things that come into play. And we talk about what clean eating looks like, which is why I'm excited to have Maria Ibrahim uh, coming on board and, and working with us in a cooking demo. But talking about how do I reduce inflammation, my inflammatory load, not just with my diet, but with my lifestyle, with my environment, with bringing plants into the home, with reducing EMS, all of the things that you talk about in your book, Dr. Tom, I'm just spewing them back out to the world. So thank you so much for that. Well, thank you. That's really great. Good, really great to hear. Thank you. Uh, says, I'm a real junkie, Dr. Tom, 100% Sicilian. So I have stupid questions laughing out loud. Just say no. I got it. All right. All right, Lisa, That I'm, I'm with you there. i I, I can't tell you how often I miss having uh, angel hair pasta, the real stuff, you know, but, but, but the gluten-free is good enough. I'm satisfied enough with, and Marzi has just gotten it down. Oh my gosh, she's making these rolls now, almond flour and something else. You know, she grinds the almonds. Uh, I bought her a gift for uh, something. I, maybe it was Christmas last year. I'm not sure. I don't remember. Uh, but it's called a Thermomix. It is the blender of blenders. And I saw a video on this thing and it just blew my mind that the person was one meal prepared in this giant blender, a whole fish being steamed, vegetables being cooked and rice in a basket where the water, the starch from the rice, so it's low starch, low glycemic index rice, 
And when you take it out, the water that the rice drip, dripped off the rice, it's all white and pasty and creamy. That's the starch that we all eat that throws our blood sugar so far out of balance. And I saw this demo and the thermal mix made it all in like 30 minutes, the whole thing. And the vegetables were crisp. The fish was delicious and the rice was, mm. so I got a thermal mix for Marzi and she uses it a lot now. And she found, or she made a recipe with uh, uh, rolls that is, they're just fabulous. I mean, she struck gold and it just happened uh, uh, last week where she did them. And, and if I remember, I'll, or if Ann remembers, we'll get the recipe and we'll post it for you guys. Okay, uh, Pat, uh, Patty, um, I'm just seeing, Patty says she takes vitamins. So it, this is part two of something. I don't see what the first part is, sorry, sorry Patty. Um, uh, let's see, Oroso, you are so right. Whenever I've stopped gluten and dairy, it shows in my blood work. I just feel at my best. Why do I keep going back to it? Well, it's like a bad relationship, you know? I mean, if, I mean, if it's like, you get really good sex in a relationship, but everything else is just terrible. Why do I keep going back to the relationship? Well, you know why. And at some point, it's not going to be worth it anymore to feel lousy the rest of the time. Karen, do you, you want to touch on this one? No, absolutely. And it goes back to mindset and it goes back to, in part, the addiction that is gluten itself. And you've talked about that, I think, at the top of the hour, and you mentioned the gluteomorphin effect. And I think that could very well be something that's taking place with this individual. You know, I, I do that a lot with with clients that are struggling and they're not getting anywhere. And we, we go right to the wheat zoomer because I tell them, this is gonna show you in black and white. We're gonna talk about these results. We're gonna talk about what it means. And you're going to see precisely why this is a problem for you and what your body's relationship is with gluten. And I think once somebody can understand what their body's relationship is with it, right? Is it toxic? Is it that bad X that we keep going back to? It's easier to then take a stand and say, okay, I now am empowered to step away and to not keep going back. And having a community of people, having a tribe that can support you and be there for you in that safe space to sort of guide you through the process is really key in turning the corner to be able to say, I'm done with you for good. Yeah, that's marvelous. And I fully, fully agree with you on that. Um, but, you know, that, that's, that's the cerebral side of it. The mm -hmm. guttural side of it is that there's an addiction to the stimulus of it. It just yes. feels good, right? So one of the things you can do is to stimulate your opiate receptors in other ways. Mm -hmm. don't, don't take opium. Don't take cocaine. <laughs> But you certainly can use CBD. You certainly can. That might help. But also spices. Yes. Spices, spices stimulate the opiate receptors at a minor amount, but just a little bit. So you may like spices. You may not. If you don't like spices, I just put a little bit in your food that you can't even taste it. But it's still getting into your body, right? And it's still going to have some benefit. I do that with cayenne. I did that for many, many years with cayenne, which is really hot red pepper flour. You know, hot peppers, and they grind it into like a, a like a, a, the consistency of salt. It's like a spice. And um, I would put cayenne on everything, but not enough to taste, because I read the studies that show how great it is for your blood vessels. And I've asked mm -hmm. Marcy to do it, and I know, and I don't. I can't tell when she does it and when she doesn't, but I see that the bottle every once in a while of cayenne is going down, 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 you know, the spice bottle. So I, I know she's using it um, and it, it doesn't have to be the taste, but add a little spices to your diet. That, that will help a little bit. Absolutely. Chandrani has a great question. I'm trying to substitute wheat flour with gluten-free flour, but the ingredients are maize, starch, potato starch, tapioca starch, xanthan gum, guar gum. I'm not sure these are healthier options. Please advise. They're not. They are not. Um, absolutely not. And th thank you for your question. And I know, um, uh, I know that Karen has um, great guidance on um, how do you produce your own flowers. Karen, do you want to talk about this a bit for answering her question? So 
definitely, I love what Marcy does with grinding the almonds and, and making almond flour. That is, you know, taking it true, truly from its source. And when we look at things from a functional nutrition standpoint, we want to get as close to the original source of the food as it came from the earth. And it is difficult to find that but it's not totally impossible. And so again, in the program we talk about, here are these great finds where you can substitute with this and stay away from the tapioca starch, the potato starch, all of those things are going to spike your blood sugar, your insulin levels. And again, they also help to induce that craving so that you want more and more. So we wanna stay away from that, but anything that you can do, um, coconut flour is really good. And a lot of times you'll find it just in its purest form of simply coconut crushed coconut powder, um, just like with the almond flour. Those are my two go-to favorites, but I'm sure there's plenty of others and, and a lot more that can be said for this. But again, I'm the kitchen hack. My chefs are, are on standby for the program. Great, great. Uh, Quincy has a question, a good question. Do you believe everyone can benefit from a gluten-free diet or could it be detrimental in any way? My husband, kids, and I are all gluten-free, but trying to explain it to an extended family uh, and they don't understand and think it's a fad. It doesn't bother them, they say. Um, there is a danger in going gluten-free. There are a few dangers um, if you don't do it right. There is absolutely no danger at all if you follow the guidance of, for example, a certified gluten-free practitioner like Karen. Uh, uh, you, you, you just need some counseling on how to do it right. The first and most important potential complication is that 78 to 81% of the prebiotics in the Western diet, those are the foods that feed the probiotics, they feed the good bacteria in our gut, prebiotics, 78 to 81% of the prebiotics in the Western diet come from wheat. So when you take wheat out of your diet, your inflammation goes down across the board, so you feel better. Some people lose weight, their energy's up, their thyroid antibodies come down, their hair grows better, they have uh, their depression goes away, all those things in the first few months. But six months, eight months, a year down the road, they're not feeling so great. And why is that? Because they took out the major source of the food they were eating, the category of food caused, called prebiotics, they took the major source in the Western diet, which is wheat, they took it out of there and they replaced it with gluten-free products, gluten-free mm -hmm. breads, gluten-free buns, gluten-free cookies, gluten-free muffins, which is just white crap, excuse me, but it's white <laughs> paint. There are no nutrients in gluten-free food. Now, I'm still gonna eat gluten-free pasta once every few weeks because I'm Italian and I like it, you know, but you can't eat that stuff every day. What you eat, need to eat is wholesome food. And so you learn what are the healthy prebiotics. And we have all kinds of courses on that at the dr.com and Karen talks about that. All of our certified gluten-free practitioners talk about it. You just need to work with someone who can give you the big picture view. So I never say everyone needs to go gluten-free because I would sound like a fanatic, but everyone that has a health concern that they don't feel satisfied with the results needs to be checked to see, is my immune system fighting wheat right now? And then those people need to go gluten-free. Now, we also know that every human, when they eat wheat, it creates in transient intestinal permeability in their gut. Within five minutes of wheat coming out of the stomach, going into the small intestine, you get leaky gut within five minutes. And that's the gateway in the development of autoimmune diseases. But it's transient. What does transient mean? It heals, Mrs. Patient, the fastest growing cells in the body are the inside lining of your gut. Every couple, three days, you have a whole new lining of your gut. So you eat toast for breakfast, you tear the lining, but it heals. You eat a sandwich for lunch, you tear the lining, but it heals. Pasta for dinner, cookie, a cookie, croutons on your salad, um, uh, a bagel the next day, chicken noodle soup for lunch. I mean, 
We have wheat two, three, four times a day, every day. So that transient leaky gut, then it heals. Transient, then it heals. Eventually, because you create so much inflammation with this, your microbiome, the good bacteria in your gut, completely alter into an inflammatory microbiome. And now you have permanent leaky gut. It's not transient anymore. And that's the gateway in the development of autoimmune diseases. That's why you have to heal the gut. And Karen and all of our certified gluten-free practitioners know exactly how to do that. But the gluten-free diet is really good for you if it's done correctly. I don't know, uh, well, I shouldn't say it that way. Uh, well, you know, I don't know of a diet that's better. Uh, I'll say it that way for mm -hmm. people. I used to think, I used to say the Mediterranean diet is something we all should strive for, eating lots of fruits and vegetables. But I came across a study and in our Facebook Live about six weeks ago with Dr. Joe Pizzorno here, I mentioned that how embarrassed I was that I didn't know about this study. It came out in 2017 and I didn't even know about it. And it was in the Journal of the American Medical Association. They took um, almost 400 women who were going to assisted fertility clinics, meaning they wanted to get pregnant. And um, so they, they were going through treatments for that. And they divided them into two groups, one group eating organic fruits and vegetables, the other group not eating organic, but rather conventional fruits and vegetables. And what they found was just jaw dropping. If you were eating more than 2.3 servings a day of conventional fruits and vegetables, compared to those that were eating organic fruits and vegetables, more than 2.3 servings a day of what you buy in the supermarket, those women had an 18% less likelihood of su uh, successful pregnancy, getting pregnant, and they had a 26% less likelihood, if they did get pregnant, of having a live birth. 26% reduction in live births if they're eating conventional fruits and vegetables. That's like, what? It's not an option anymore to go organic. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, we were saying, well, it'd be good to eat as more organic if you can. You know, it's not an option anymore because there are so many insecticides and pesticides and fungicides on all of our fruits and vegetables. You must go organic if you have a health condition that you're dealing with. You must, because these pesticides are, are uh, it's like pouring sugar in a gas tank. I don't know if you ever did. I, I'm exposing myself now as a kid in Detroit. We would, you know, uh, we did some fun, not nice things like that. But you put, you put sugar in somebody's gas tank and eventually the car won't start and it's full of gas, right? So that was bad. And, and I'm making amends for the rest of my life. I've been making amends for those, those Detroit actions. Um, but you're eating fruits and vegetables, the Mediterranean diet, which we think is so healthy for us, but it's not anymore unless it's organic. Right. Because, because of the amount of toxins that are in the fruits and vegetables. And if you cannot, get organic. You go to My Green Fills. We'll put the link in here, and let's put the link to My Green Fills. You get their vegetable wash, and when you buy your fruits and vegetables, you bring them home, you immediately wash them in that vegetable wash, which gets over 95%. We did a Facebook Live with Stephen Izell, the president of that company, um, about a year and a half ago, I think it was, and my jaw dropped when he talked about how much of the waxes and the pesticides and insecticides are removed just by dipping it in a little tub of water with their veggie wash stuff. Mm -hmm. So you, you use that on all your fruits and vegetables and you go to ewg.org, environmentalworkinggroup.org. You download their list of the dirty dozen. Those are the ones with the most 
pesticides and insecticides and you just stay away from the dirty dozen and you download the clean 15. Those are the ones that have the least amount of insecticides and pesticides. And then you dip them in the veggie wash stuff so that you reduce it even further. Karen, anything you want to add to that? No, I'm in 100% agreement. I use a veggie wash as well. Chef Maria has the Eat Cleaner and I've, I've watched her lives and I've done my own trials with dipping it in the wash and looking at the difference. And you would not believe what comes off of your fruits and vegetables. It's absolutely appalling. And you think people just rinse it off. Well, you wouldn't just rinse a fork that's been God knows where and then eat from it, would you? You would want to wash and know that it's disinfected and it's clean. Why aren't we doing the same things with our apples and our produce? So absolutely a thousand percent, definitely organic and definitely clean your produce. Right, right, agree, agree. Uh, Allison says, with the hiatal hernia, try to avoid eating spicy foods, carbonated beverages, acidic foods and several other things that your doctor can discuss with you and don't eat at least two hours before bed. Eating mm -hmm. late is a big component of having troubles. Well, those are good suggestions, Allison. And also, why do you have a hiatal hernia? Yes. Uh, of course, those are the things that you wanna do if you're suffering to avoid irritating it, but you gotta find out where's it coming from. That's critically important. Um, oh, I see the question beforehand. Mary Ann says, if someone has been diagnosed with a hiatal hernia, um, has done food sensitivity testing, stool sample testing, try to do an elimination diet, and is still having days where he is totally off, where there is either heartburn or immediately needs to go to the washroom once eating, diarrhea, what other testing should be done? See a chiropractor. There's no question. Sometimes it's a mechanical problem. When you've done yes, 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 check the mechanics because sometimes that, that can give miraculous results. Um, uh, Karen, anything you want to add to that one? No, I, I have a chiropractor as well, and I agree. You have, to, you have to work backwards, right? We have to figure out what is the root cause? Why is it happening? So if we've addressed food, we've addressed, we've addressed environment, and we've addressed everything that we're taking in or putting on our bodies, and that does not seem to be making a difference, then yes, absolutely. Check the mechanics, see a chiropractor, see if we maybe have something that's misaligned because that affects the communication system within the body, and then things get thrown off. That's exactly right, exactly right. Cheryl says, off topic, but you've said colostrum plays the symphony. Yes, it does. So colostrum and propolis could heal leaky gut, right? Um, well, um, colostrum and propolis are really good for that purpose, but remember, colostrum is mother nature's way of healing a leaky gut, but the only uh, people that drink colostrum to heal a leaky gut our newborns, mm -hmm. the first three days of three to five days of mother's breast milk is colostrum. It's not milk. And they turn on the genes to heal the gut that quickly. But you're not a newborn. So colostrum certainly helps, but it's not the magic bullet. What's the magic bullet? What's the magic bullet? Rebuild the microbiome. You've got a altered microbiome causing the inflammation that creates the leaky gut. So colostrum is an important component of that, as is propolis. Uh, propolis is not at the same tier as colostrum, but it's a great product and I've used it before. Uh, uh, but you can't just take the product and keep the same gut that you've currently got if you've been diagnosed with the leaky gut. That's called a dysbiotic gut and you have to rebuild a healthy microbiome, critically important. Karen, anything you want to add to that one? I just, I'm going to pose a question that I do hear a lot from clients in terms of if they have celiac and they have maybe a related dairy sensitivity, what does colostrum do for them? Is that something they should be avoiding? And I know the answer, but I want, I want for you to share that with the group because I know that question comes up often and you probably hear it as well um, because it, it is colostrum, it's coming from milk. Is it something that someone with a dairy or lactose intolerance should be avoiding? That's a really good question. And my answer to that has always been the same. And that is, Mrs. Patient, we just found out that you've got a dairy sensitivity. All right, get it all out of there, get it all out. Um, but you also have a leaky gut and colostrum plays the entire symphony. So let's try 
a bottle of this, you know, just try some. And if you have any problems, you get any pain or any discomfort, then just stop right away. Uh, but it's worth the, the investment to try because nothing heals as quickly and comprehensively as colostrum does. Nothing. It plays the entire symphony as opposed <laughs> to all of the one note players. So it's worth a try. It's not going to harm you in any way, but get the dairy out. You know, get the milk out and the cheese and the ice cream. Well, if I can have colostrum, I can have an ice cream once in a while. No, you can't. No. You know, that's just playing with fire, right? So um, that's the way that we've always looked at it because, and it's a clinical judgment call, but I think for a couple of months, using colostrum when you're first addressing leaky gut is tremendously helpful. And as long as it doesn't give you any symptoms, any burping or belching or gas or bloating, uh, then go ahead and use it for a couple of months and then you'll be completely dairy free um, when you've completed that two months. Good, good to know. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, Cigna asked, can I mash beans, peas, and lentils into flour? I don't know. There is there is lentil flour. Yeah, I've heard of that. I, yeah. I have not tried it myself, but I'm sure that it's possible. Yeah, actually, um, some of the protein powders, um, uh, some of the vegan protein powders mm -hmm. have pea. Pea protein. And garbanzo bean flour. So yeah, it's yeah. really possible. Um, sure, and chickpea flour, for sure. There's so many great recipes now for making flour, depending on what it is you're trying to make. My sister has, it took her a few years, but she has dialed down, you know, as I've said, we're Italian and our family meal every year at Christmas was always the same. And that was ravioli and uh, rabbit because my grandfather grew up hunting rabbits for Christmas, right? And so we always had rabbit and raviolis. And my sister dialed it down for gluten-free ravioli. There were a few years when, you know, they fall apart in the pot when they're boiling. And, and sometimes they were so thick, you know, so much flour that was chewy. And, but then she, she got it down. And uh, uh, we'll make a note for the gluten-free uh, ravioli recipe uh, for some time in the new year to share with everyone. Janice asks, why does my doctor not show concern and not put me on a diet or meds? Well, you can get that answer really easily. Ask your doctor how many courses in nutrition he had in med school, and it's <laughs> zero. So you can't expect them to be nutritionally oriented. It's not fair. They went to med school with high hopes of saving the planet, you know, in their own way, helping people. And so they believe what they were taught and the education system is so brutal to beat people down so they don't question anything. They come out mm -hmm. believing that they know the answers, uh, but they have no training in nutrition whatsoever. Absolutely none. So you can't expect them to answer your questions about nutrition. You have to find a nutritionist who seems rational and makes sense to you who has studied nutrition. And it's great when they're also a physician or a um, uh, trained health coach. Uh, it's great, uh, but you, you have to look for someone who has spent the time and the dollars in the education to learn all of this. You ask your medical doctor about medicine. You ask your nutrition doctor or your nutrition healthcare practitioner about nutrition. They're not the same. No. Do you have ideas for me after my daughter seems to be gluten, as I described above? Um, uh, yeah, there's an entire emergency protocol uh, that, uh, oh my God, it's 7.05. Uh, let's save that question for next week because uh, we've gone <laughs> over the hour. And uh, well, Karen, it goes so fast. It, it does. It really does. Yeah. Thank you so well, much. You're very welcome. It's really a pleasure to have you here. And we posted your book, the link for your book here. So everyone, please go pick up Karen's book. If you get one idea that you implement for the rest of your life in your cooking, 
it's well worth it. And I'm sure there'll be many, many ideas, many, many awakenings you'll have. And for those that are in the process of dialing in how, how to be gluten-free, do the journaling. Nothing, I don't think that can be as supportive as when you do the journaling. Yes, definitely do the journaling, do the group program. We have a group program that's centered specifically around the book. It starts on January 4th, runs through February 3rd. And you get all kinds of access to me, including a power session with me, but you also have the sessions weekly, twice a week with the group. And we have journaling, we have homework assignments, but we have a lot of fun with it as well. And it's a safe, supportive space to share in your success and your setbacks and all of your journey. And then as well, to know that you're in good company, because I know a lot of people when they're first going gluten-free feel like they're on an island and no one around them understands and they don't want to put too much pressure on you, but you feel like you're still getting it. It's not gonna hurt you just to have a little bit. And so we take no, all that away. We dial it back and we go through the science, we go through the mindset and we go through the training to fully understand how to properly stock your kitchen, how to set up your food prep, your food storage so that you don't cross contaminate yourself in your own home because let's be honest, that's where a lot of it's happening. And then we have our special guests, our chefs coming in to do some cooking uh, demos with us. So it's gonna be a great time. Please sign up. Everyone watching tonight through the next 24 hours, we're giving $50 off the registration fee. So please, please go ahead and join. We'd love to have you on board. Look at and all the hearts, all the hearts and the yeah. thumbs up that are coming. I love it, I love it, I love really it. I love it. So I can't see the hearts from here, but I, I trust oh, you. I, I, I'm believing for it. So. We're, we're flying up the screen. Karen, thank it. you so it. very much. Thank you. Absolutely. Right, Thank, Thank you. you. See you next week. Bye. Take care.